Yeah, it was the day before our baptism. We sat down with the preachers, and we had a book with all these rules. Oh, but it was like a pretty thick book with all these rules, like, you know, flowers on your dress the size of whatever, and to, to the T, all these rules. And so the preachers, they sat down with us, and there was, I think, three preachers, and they said, before you get baptized into the church, we just need you to promise that you're going to follow this book. And I knew I hadn't been following the book, and mm. I wasn't planning to follow the book, because to me it didn't line up with the Bible. It just had all right. these extras. Welcome to Enlighten the Gospel. My name is Dan Blatz. Today I'll be interviewing John Dyke, Johnny Dyke, as most of us know him. I've known him since he was quite small, but then for many years didn't see him. He grew up in the old colony church, but then went to a more conservative church. Conservative Mennonites, many of us local people maybe somewhat derogatorily call them the white cap Mennonites. I'm not sure if that's the right thing or a good thing to say, but that was how we knew them. And he grew up there in a very, uh, how do you say it, rule-based system to where he felt like the rules that were being enforced upon him were not from God, and so he felt comfortable skirting the rules, disobeying, disregarding the rules, as long as he was obeying the Bible, he thought. But it turns out, after many years of trying to do what is good and right before God, he found himself as a sinner before God also, not only rebelling against the rules of the church, but he found himself also in sin against God. And yet he didn't know where to go to fix it. It took many years, and it takes quite a while in his story today to get to the point where he finally understands the work of the Lord Jesus. It took him well into his 20s, maybe into his early 30s. I forget his exact age now. But it's quite a ways into our story of how he finally came to accept what Christ had done for him, rather than him trying to keep rules to repent correctly, to repent sufficiently. And uh, I think this will be impactful for many of you. He, he grew up in a different system, as I said, but still the concept of coming to God by faith in Christ alone, not by works, not by rule keeping, and not even by trying to have enough faith, but simply coming and trusting what Christ has done. So thanks for following along. Thanks for watching these videos and sharing them with your friends. I appreciate all the subscriptions to the channel and the liking and the comments. I really appreciate the the back and forth we're getting to st starting to see in the comment section too. So hopefully people continue to do that and I appreciate you coming around. So um, growing up, you guys were at the old colony for a little bit. Yeah, I would have went to the old colony till uh, grade five. Grade five, so you were like 12 years old, no, 10, nine probably. I don't yeah, think I was, that's how it works. Yeah, I was trying to think because Tux is in, uh, I think he's in grade four or five and he's nine. Yeah, that would make sense. Yeah, so, and then uh, like my sister was getting to youth age at that point and so she started hanging out with uh, like her and some of her friends started going to the I guess conservative youth okay and so that's where and I think my parents were just happy that you know instead of getting like into the partying group or whatever she was headed more spiritual yeah yeah and so yeah that's interesting where the whole family because a lot of the old colony youth wanted nothing to do with like getting together to sing songs or read the bible or anything like that it was more just get together party and whatever else yeah i know your dad was a yeah. um, sunday school teacher for some time right or principal maybe even yeah seven years he had been principal <clears throat> yeah. like right up till that point did and he then, do the the school as well the private school like that's where he was principal at the okay. private school okay yeah okay now yeah now i'm remembering clearly that was uh he he was seen as quite strict yeah right very stickler for you got to do it the right way right yeah sounds right yeah yeah and then he was zinga too for yep i remember always doing zingstun and okay stuff, so. so you have some memories of old colony back in the day yeah i think you said you even remember the time you and i had something to do with each other i would have been more with your older brother uh, in Sunday school, I think. Okay. What's it, Pete? Yeah. Yeah. He's he's about my age, I think, right? Could be. I would say he's... What year were you born? 89. 89. Okay. So he's... Uh, and you're... How much older is he than you? 
I'm gonna say like three, okay, four so years or somewhere in there. Yeah, I uh, hung out with your cousin David Dyke back in the day. Okay, we lived just down the road from Willie Simons and yeah. you know, play hockey or whatever else together. Yeah. So then, when you guys, uh, your your sister started getting into the conservative youth group, then the the whole family kind of slowly tended towards that, or what happened there? Yeah, I think she came home and said, "Hey, like mom, dad, you know this is like we're doing Bible studies and stuff," and so. Uh, somehow we went to church there and just kept going to church. Interesting. Whole family, yeah. Because it was actually at that time, probably around that same time frame, that there was a group that left Old Colony, and one of the things that they were really pushing for was let's do some Bible study, let's sing together, let's do prayer meeting, that kind of thing, and it was very much shunned, right? Like it was, who do you think you are? And I, I was one of them who thought, what do you guys, you think you should not this type of people, right? One mm -hmm. of the guys had come to a brother's meeting with a beard like yours and mine maybe, and some of the older men had pulled on his beard and said, who do you think you are? Are you going to tell us how to... And he was he was trying to be humble, I think, saying, like, hey, we just want to do some Bible study. And they yeah. just mocked him and, and all that. So your dad probably at that time was had some desire for better for his children too, right? Absolutely, yeah. And I think it must have been, you know, sort of hard for him, like thinking now. Oh, yeah. Uh, you know, being so involved in the church and yep. then leaving for this stuff so it must have been a pretty big conviction or whatever of Absolutely. his to get him to go there and i think he's seen it was like you know he wanted the best for the kids yeah his kids so so you guys would have gone to uh what we often refer to as conservative christian or white cap type yeah christian church yeah how was that transition do you remember like for me at nine years old who cares eh? who cares i was uh going to a different school like new friends and I pretty much click with guys right away so yeah to me it wasn't uh it, it didn't make really a big difference okay. at all yeah were you uh, at like at a young age old colony age and then into that new conservative church were you conscious of God at all or was that not really a thing that you cared about I think so uh but I was like I didn't have a fear or I feel like I was super innocent like carefree and very happy okay. like that that young part of my life i remember it being like no fear of god really i i just kind of like whatever my parents said i believe there was a god and figured we were on the right path and uh yeah so i think that was there you go yeah so there wasn't this going to bed scared at night kind of stuff too much eh? no do you remember when you started kind of feeling guilty before god uh, I would say probably around 13, 14, like, because we'd have revival meetings oh, yeah. at the conservative church, right? Yeah. And so that's when it'd become like, uh, you know, big pressure or big talk about hell. And I remember always, like, I kind of hated these meetings, and we'd have them at our church, any whatever church is close by. And so. It was kind of normal. You would even travel up to an hour mm -hmm. to go to revival meetings to hear these big, because there was always special speakers. Visiting preachers. Yeah. 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 And so that's when I started, you know, feeling all tense and, and getting worked up. Interesting. Yeah. I wonder, wonder sometimes about that kind of stuff, because sometimes you can have a group of people where the young people just grow up kind of, yeah, we're Christian, and they don't really care. They're not scared. They're not scared of God. Yep. They also don't seem to really love God. There's no real... So I think probably those groups were thinking, hey, we need to wake these young people up. They need to somehow get uh, really, really convicted and some kind of passion for this, right? Yeah. So there's a, a constant push for decisions. Was it like a come to the front altar call kind of stuff? Yeah. Yeah? Yeah. You had to either put your hand up and then they would pray with you. And yeah. Yeah. I would imagine there must have been some pretty good gospel at times there too, eh? Like... I I would think, yeah. you know, I was just, yeah, to me it was all about, yeah, my own fear and, you know. I hell, was hell becomes very real, right? Exactly. Yeah. Interesting. I know there's um, <clears throat> the Mennonite culture in particular, even maybe somewhat generally, the, uh, say, something like the divorce rates are really, really low. Like in our culture, uh, old colony type of Mennonite people, what is it, maybe 5% or less? Whereas the culture around us is like 50% or more sometimes, right? As far as divorce rates. And part of it, what keeps people into those marriages is just 
Like you don't want to be seen as one of those. So everybody's afraid to walk out of a really bad marriage. Even sometimes women, you know, seriously suffering abuse or whatever, and they just can't, like, no way. Yeah, I don't want to be seen as one of those people. And so fear is a pretty strong motivator. And same with a small child, you know, do you want to go to hell? Yeah. Well, no, no, I don't want to go to hell. Yeah. Well, then you better start responding at the altar call or you better, you know, wear the right things and button up the shirt and stuff like that, right? Oh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and, and then peer pressure too, you know, because uh, you're just expected, uh, if you want to be one of us or whatever, you're expected to, at a certain age, become a Christian and, mm -hmm. and, and receive that call. I remember a buddy of mine, he actually got the courage because he felt so condemned and guilty that uh, he stood up and I was thinking like man because you know he was a troublemaker he was probably number one troublemaker at okay. school and so I was thinking like you know what's is this guy going to be completely different now next day at school and as soon as we meet up in school he probably said more swear words than he <laughs> ever did before just to prove to me that I'm it's no all different. good no, like, you know, yesterday I couldn't handle the pressure. I got but, a bit emotional. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But he was to prove because he wanted to show, you know, that he was almost embarrassed that he I see. did he did that. And here's me thinking, like, you know, I get it. I get the pressure. Like, you know, I was almost hoping that maybe he would be different. Yeah, because then you then would, would feel comfortable being good, too. Exactly. Cause mm. I, Do you think that was kind of a general thing in the church? Was there a lot of young people that were just resisting trying not to be the good goody goody not really there was there was like a group who took everything in you know okay. they kind of fit the mold whatever and they would just accept it and then there was a few of a few of us who would kind of felt like fight against that okay yeah what what preoccupied you then during those teenage years when you were kind of starting to feel guilty but not really committing to the church and all of its rules and whatever else were you into sports quite a bit then already i was yeah so i like i spent almost all of my life outside like mm -hmm. i would go to school and then afterwards i'd go and grab whatever i was into like either a bat and a ball and i'd hit for hours or or skateboard or rollerblade or non-stop i did that yeah exactly yeah. i was always doing that and and i don't like i was thinking about it and what's crazy is because i would hang out with like the neighbor kids and one of these guys was like his house was rough shape and he would uh you know like there'd be screaming coming from his parents or whoever his mom was living with at the time hmm. and i'd hang out with him a lot and i tried to teach him like christian stuff like yeah. i would try to teach him to pray in that time which yeah that's it's uh, a good thing yeah so and I'm kind of surprised I didn't get like into more nasty stuff from hanging out with right. him. Right. Yeah. But uh, there was a kid in growing up in Mount Salem that everybody kind of knew. He just kind of wandered around. His parents were really quite old, and they just didn't seem to really care. And he just was always around. He was a bit younger than me, or else he might have had more influence on me too. But uh, you know, I got introduced to pornography at his house. That kind of stuff was his house was just do whatever you want, whenever you want. Didn't matter, right? Yeah. And so that kind of stuff is is pretty dangerous for a young young boy for sure. Hundred percent, yeah. I'm, uh, you know, I'm probably thankful to this day that I didn't get introduced to that stuff from him. Yeah. You know, it seems shocking, and I do remember him at a young, super young. He came break to me. He's like, "I'm not a virgin anymore." Whoa! And it was he was like really young, and uh, but yeah. And you're like, "Excuse me, what does that mean?" Yeah, it's pretty much. <laughs> yeah, I feel like I was pretty innocent. Yeah, young guy. So. Yeah. Did you uh, uh, during those teenage years? Then did you ever make that decision? Did you walk forward and? Yeah, so I guess some of like me and some of the guys figured out that you could just go instead of having this awkward thing where you put your hand up or stood up, and then you had to go and pray with a, uh, you know, with this preacher who you didn't know. We were like you don't have to do that you can just go tell your dad and then you can become a christian like that okay and so i know me and uh for sure one of my other buddies that's what we did and i truly wanted i didn't want uh you know to live a rebellious life i want to be a good person i want to be a christian yeah 
and so I, I would say I was probably 14 and I went to my told my dad like that I want to be a Christian and I was kind of expecting him to say okay like you know, we need to pray a sinner's prayer, whatever they did at the revival meetings, I kind yeah. of expected. And he just said, Johnny, that's the best news ever. And he walked over and he goes, finds my mom. He's like, hey, you know, Johnny uh, is a Christian now. He wants to be a Christian. I was sitting there thinking like, but isn't there something I need to do? Yeah. Like, what do we got to do here? And, uh, and he's like, Okay, awesome. There, everybody's all happy. I'm a Christian, and so I kind of figured out. All right, I'm going to take this into my own hands. You know, I can do this stuff, and so I, I started being the best Christian that I knew how. So I went and confessed all my, you know, every sin I could think of, and and then I tried to kind of make things right where I could, and hmm. I tried to. I decided like I'm going to follow the Bible mm -hmm. to the best I can. And so that's where it started. And and then my dad came to me like probably, I don't know if it was the same day. And he's like, all right, so now you're going to start instruction class and and become a member of the church. And, uh, and I said, no, dad, uh, that's not what I signed up for. I just want to be a Christian. I don't want to be a member of the church, uh, do instruction class, whatever. I just want to, now okay. I want to follow the Bible. And I think he's thinking like that is following the Bible. Yeah, like being a Christian when you say that, that's now you're not supposed to be rebellious anymore. You know, now you're supposed to be go to instruction class and and do what we want you yeah. to do. Like kind of follow the. And I said no. I I just want to be a Christian. That's what I want to do now. And he says, well, you know, you don't have to become a member because I I felt super young too. I thought. Yeah. Yeah. And he says, you don't have to become a member, but at least start going to instruction class, and maybe you can go through a couple terms of that. And so that's what I started. Okay. Yeah. Well, one thing that seems kind of clear to me is um, this concept of uh, God doesn't have grandchildren, right? Each child needs to be born again themselves. And that's something that I think our Mennonite culture and in the Baptist culture, they've kind of gotten that correct. You must be born again, right? You can't... You can't be born naturally as a Christian. And so the strong emphasis that each young person in the church had to also make a decision, they have to come to God themselves, is probably a good, overall a good idea, right? Where you can't just take for granted that, yeah, I was raised in a good home. Some people still do. They feel comfortable because, no, I've always been kind of good and we come from a stable home. We're, in, we're influential in the church, so we, sh we should be fine. But the strong emphasis with revival meetings and stuff probably always kind of tore that down. Like, no, no, you have to. You have to become a Christian. So that part is pretty valuable, I think. Yeah. But then when you say, I want to become a Christian, and there's no presentation of Christ to you, there's no clear understanding of Christ and His work, it, it, then it just leaves you to thinking, okay, well, now i got to try harder to be a Christian, right? Exactly. That's, you know, then I went, like, I, I was like, what can I do? And so I started doing, you know, what I thought I could do. And I, if somebody... I don't know if I would have understood it at the time, but if somebody would have came to me and said, uh, read me that verse, by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified, mm -hmm. maybe I would have realized, oh, there's nothing I can do. But, you know, I didn't understand that. I figured it was completely on me mm -hmm. to start right at that moment and to be the best yeah, Christian, yeah. follow the Bible the best I could. Yeah, that's interesting. I, I remember years ago being on the streets preaching the gospel, and I was just starting to understand that grace is absolutely free. You don't need to make a single change. You don't need to change your clothes or your hairstyle or what kind of car you drive. You can just simply believe in Jesus right here today, and you can become a Christian. And I would tell people that, and then they would look over my shoulder and see the people that were with me and see how they were dressed and stuff like that. And then they, I could see them kind of calculating in their mind, thinking, you say I just need to believe, but the people that believe look like that. So that means I have to start to become like that or else I can't be saved, right? And I'm like, no, 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 you don't have to be anything like that. But they still couldn't put two and two together, right? So even you, as a child, the, the standard of the church is a certain kind of car, a certain kind of clothes, a certain kind of hairstyle is acceptable, a certain is not. Some activities are okay, some activities are not. And very much based on this outward appearance type of thing, right? Yeah. So now, okay, now I'm a Christian. Now i got to try even harder to do all these things. 
and there's no real conversion, right? So, I mean, I'm sure plenty, plenty of people have been genuinely converted and then just want to please God. But the danger is there where people just think, okay, now i got to start checking the list. Yeah. And I think I was definitely different than a lot, where a lot of guys would have, you know, they would have said, okay, they would have done instruction, became a member, whatever was told, and they would have followed. But somehow for me, I like to me it was becoming a Christian was following the Bible mm -hmm. and not the rules. So even after that, I always had issues because i would always question like all the rules because we had you know unlimited rules it seemed like so many things like what what kind of rules like what color your pants were uh what color socks shoes did you, did you give a question at why why this color or why this style oh i i did big time i said i right away said i don't find this in the bible any of this all these rules so where are we getting these rules from and what, what do they say uh, if you don't have rules, you're just going to go okay. downhill. So I wonder if, you know, the, there's some verses in the Bible that say, uh, obey them that have the rule over you. So even if this rule isn't in the Bible, the rulers put that rule in place. So now you got to obey your rulers, right? Yeah. It was, and they would also say, like, I mean, you just don't understand Mm. at this point because instead of giving you a good solid reason for it yeah and i, I would say because we weren't allowed to have instruments either we weren't allowed to listen to instruments right. radio any of this and i would say and i always had these crazy arguments probably didn't even make sense but i would say like but king or david prayed for king saul yeah and all this stuff and if there's the book of psalms full of instruments yeah instruments in the bible then how did that become wrong and it was non-stop stuff like that with yeah. me and I would I would be pushing it I remember uh, I also worked with like I worked with a couple conservative guys and then one guy who would have been like charity and then a guy from lighthouse and so there was a quite a variety wide variety and here was me this little guy here you know watching these guys thinking who was a Christian or not and I would have these arguments, and I would say, like, <laughs> I would be singing dance music, for instance, at the job, because I would listen to that, because I was like, I don't see anything wrong with, there's no bad words in there, and so I can listen to dance music. So I, and they were like, what are you singing? Because they kind of knew that from at some point, too, yeah. these popular songs, you know, and so my, the conservative guys would be like, man, what are you singing? And I was like, yeah, I'm singing this song. There's, I don't see what's wrong with, I don't see anything in the okay. Bible that's saying this is a wrong. And they would be like, man, you're, you're so far off. You're really toeing the line there, eh? Yeah. Dancing with something very close to evil, right? Exactly. Even if they couldn't put their finger on saying this is wrong. Like you're, you're getting in the realm of wrong, right? And yeah. there is some dangers like that. So uh, there are some people who would say things like, well, in the Old Testament, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, uh, David, Solomon, they all had multiple wives. So why can't we, right? Yeah. And so the conservatives might kind of go to something like that. So just because they did it doesn't mean it was the right thing. But musical instruments were there to give praise to God, right? They, uh, Elisha, I think it was, when he was looking to prophesy for King Ahab, he said, call a harpist. And then somebody came and played the harp, and then he got the revelation from God, right? So the, you know, music was used as a very good and godly thing. Uh, to bring praise to God or to connect with God in some way, right? So yeah. it's a different different story altogether. But. Yeah, and I think, you know, I was just, it wasn't all that I was arguing for truth, you know, I just, just wanted to. Just a little to, bit contrary. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> a little bit rebellious. Yeah. What's that, when did you start working? At what age would you have been on the job site already? Uh, like the day before I was 16, I was okay. framing, yep. No more school then. Yeah. Did you like school though? I didn't mind it. Did yeah. you do okay? Yeah, it seemed it seemed super easy. Like the conservative school that we went to, it was like, yeah, they just kind of almost went according to your level mm. of stuff. So it was, you could read and write well, pretty quick. And all like that. I feel like at the old colony school, I had went like there. It was like you follow the light units and stuff. So when I went from there. I think I could have hopped from grade five to grade seven or whatever oh, okay. easily. Like it was super easy for me. Interesting. Yeah. 
So then at 15, you finished up, and you were at, by the time you're 16, you're working pretty much full-time. Yeah, I finished grade 10, so... Yeah, same with me. Yeah, so I don't know if that would have been when I was 15. Yeah, I just, just thought about this yesterday, because my daughter just turned 16, and I was thinking if she was in school, she'd be now in grade 11. Then we went back and forth and thought, no, is it 10, is it 11? But then I remembered, I finished grade 10, had our summer break, and then my birthday's in September, and I never went back to school at 16. So I had finished grade 10 at 15, so... Oh yeah, that would make sense. My birthday was in August, so okay, very similar then. Yeah. yeah. So then it was uh, a lot more influence from people outside your family and the direct church culture, right? A couple guys from your church, but a several guys from outside the church. Yeah, exactly. Did Did any of their arguments against you ever kind of penetrate, or did you always feel like, eh, I know better? <laughs> no, I remember the guy from Lighthouse. I think he got a bit of a kick out of my arguments yeah. because he. A lot of these things, he was like, hey, now give an answer, guys, to this young guy who's grown up. And he had a lot of the same questions, but I think he liked seeing it from one of, yeah, you know. Because you were a conservative guy. Exactly. And I, I don't know if uh, being growing up in the old colony also played with me questioning things, you mm. know, because all like we were allowed to do more things in the old colony even dress and stuff so I, even in school i always had a little bit on the edge clothes and my parents just didn't know so i could kind of push it and you know they didn't they hadn't been conservative from way back yeah, yeah that would make a difference if you were born and raised in that congregation you might never question any of it exactly that's what i wonder if because i had a switch and, and all of a sudden went to stricter stuff if that's yeah. why i questioned well that would have been my case actually i was born raised old colony never went anywhere else always the elmer old colony all the way till I was 21 and I never thought to question anything even. I was just content more or less with how it was. I mean, with a few uh, variations there maybe, but uh, once I had stepped outside the old colony, there was a split in the old colony and, and one of the preachers left. Then it started to open the door like, oh, there is different ways of thinking. There is a different way of understanding and interpreting certain, stu certain passages and whatnot. And so I can see that once you have seen something else, you saw the the old colony and the, li the freedom liberty that you had from there and now some of that was taken away and now you're like why is this not allowed this is something i used to do and everything was fine yeah so i can see why that would cause some questioning yeah exactly so i would imagine that got you into some hot water at times questioning your parents or questioning the church leaders instruction classes did you question things there too or no not really i kind of it was more of a setting where everybody just listens yes exactly like stuff like that i I didn't really even dare to voice my opinions, but mm -hmm. it was more like with family, my parents, or people. Were you seen as rebellious, or were you still seen as kind of a good conservative kid for the most part? I, At that age, like 16, 18, that kind of thing. I think seen as kind of a guy on, like, a little bit pushing it. Okay. Like, not super anything crazy, but, yeah. A little, just because everything would have been pushing the limits with yeah. clothes and all this stuff be, especially because i you know i a lot of these things i thought like didn't make sense so. but in your mind especially looking back now you weren't necessarily trying to say i want to do sinful things it was why is this rule that's not in the bible the standard that was more what you were questioning at that time absolutely yeah. And then you, uh, I remember you were saying to me once years ago that sports became a kind of a taboo thing, right? Where you were in conservative church, but you were playing on a team, on an actual baseball team, right? Yeah. And so that's, that's what happened with working with the guy from Lighthouse. Yeah. And so he was talking about they were going to start playing. He was starting a new team and it was in Sparta at the time in the Christian yeah. men's league. And so I was like, Hey, like, I love baseball. Can I play? And he's like, yeah, yeah, sure. And my brother's like, dude, we're conservatives, man. There's no you way you can that. play on that team. And I was like, why not? It's you just, just baseball. A logo on your shirt yeah. and all that stuff. And that's what he said. Like, dude, they have like names on the shirt and stuff. And I said, I love baseball. I'm playing baseball. Like, I'm going to. And so the guy from Lighthouse, he says, you know what? If your dad says you can play then you can play and once again dad didn't really know didn't know what the rules were directly eh? yeah and so i just kind of convinced him i'm just playing baseball like and i probably had a little you know didn't exactly a little sneaky, little sneaky where i said <laughs> you know 
uh, just like once or twice a week play baseball with some guys and yeah. stuff. And and one thing that helped is he also, I think my dad thought that uh, this guy was a, a good guy, yeah. you know. He, he probably would have even called him a Christian, possibly. I remember his, his sisters and stuff would have been good Christian people according to his standard, right? Exactly. And I actually remember him later on when I got in trouble for this. Then he went and talked to this guy and kind of uh, said, like, hey, I appreciate what you've done or for working with my son and stuff. Mm. And But it, uh, so at first you just kind of got away with it. People didn't really know. Your dad just kind of said, sure, go play baseball with the boys. Exactly. And, pe- and people didn't know. And plus I wasn't a member okay. yet. Quite. That makes a difference. Oh yeah, like if I would have been a a member, I would have somebody would have come after you. Oh yeah, there's no chance I would have. Okay. Done that. So, so did you play just one season, or how did that work? One season, yep. Yeah, and then during that, you kind of got caught almost. Yeah, exactly. I got caught towards the end, and I see a reason why it was such a big no-no is because I was in instruction class, so it was like. You're pretty much trying to become a member. Become a member, and yet you're doing something like this. Okay. And so... And, and it was kind of seen as, like, almost borderline sinful or completely sinful. I think com- kind of completely really? sinful. Like, uh, because I had... I Later on, I kind of argued with the preachers about this, and they, they gave the verse, uh, when I was a child, I thought as a child but I became a man. And so they were saying Put I was childish thing. Yeah. That's what I was doing. So the, the games, they would have not necessarily said that they're evil, like drinking and partying, but they're just unnecessary, silly, silly activity. You yeah. guys would have been okay to play a game together as a church though. Yeah, exactly. Like in school you would play. And then every year at the picnic, you'd usually yeah. have a game. Yeah. It's just that you were going out playing competitively. Yeah. yeah, I remember when I first became a Christian, I kind of got fairly convinced of a, a very conservative, outward conservative mindset, and I gave up baseball too, partially for good reason because it was it had become my life. Right, I was playing two, three, four times a week, playing on tournaments during the weekends yet, and it was just I was obsessing over it. So I just gave it all up just to get my mind straight on it. But part of it was too that I thought, well, it's vain. It's it's all useless. And now I can see there's a lot of value in it, too, teaching your kids, as long as they're not becoming completely sold out to it. But there's always a period where they do, right, where they get really excited about it. Yeah. Maybe think it's going to be their future. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I, later on, I got obsessed with, after we got married, I got obsessed with hockey. Yeah. Like, that's, you know, all I could think about, practically. It's funny how that does that to you, right? Yeah. So then uh, how did you get caught or what happened when you got exposed for playing on a competitive team? Well, the I guess the further I got into, uh, like, closer I got to becoming a member. And so um, I'm not sure, like, word gets around and, you know, somebody hears about it. Mm-hmm. And so then they, it was like probably a couple of days before I was going to get baptized and then the preachers came over and they said you know there's an issue that we've heard about yet is that you were you played baseball or whatever and they were kind of wondering is there other things and that's where we had that talk and they said well we're going to have you're going to have to confess that at your baptism that you were playing on this team and I was like well confess what yeah and I had you know because I had been all the time confessing my faults like things that you felt were actual sin exactly to try to get them cleared up but mm-hmm. this didn't really make sense to me I see yeah what age was that I think I would say 15 16 okay yeah so you were, yeah you were already working with uh, the guy from Lighthouse yeah that's right so, so that 16. would have been 16 somewhere yeah. interesting yeah. And then, I don't know if you have anything between there and Nettie, but how young were you when you met Nettie? Is there something that kind of leads to... Well, I met her... Or you would have met her when you were younger. Yeah, grade six. Okay. Is where I had my first impression of her. Okay. And I liked her right away. So. Uh-oh. <laughs> but, uh... Grade six, that's like seven, no, 11 years old. Yeah. 10, 11. It was like childish, right? <laughs> yeah. And stuff. But... Uh, and you were taken with her. Yeah, exactly. 
and then uh but when i was 16 so part of that was like like i had all these friends and that's what kept me i think uh with the staying with the church was i had a bunch of friends there mm -hmm. by this point and like family was there and nettie was there too and so and she had been there from you know small on up mm -hmm. and so uh yeah i think the biggest thing though before that was my baptism like that was a pretty huge part because i was i was still trying like i would Anytime we had revivals, I would I still always got that scared feeling or whatever. So before a revival meeting, I would get down and, uh, like, I would pray extra hard before we had revivals. Like, begging God for forgiveness and begging Him for peace. Because I wanted to have peace. Mm -hmm. I wanted to be relaxed when, when I was hearing this, you know, hellfire kind of preaching and stuff. So I would, and I would beg God, I would, like, for every sin... And then I would jump up and see if I felt peace or not. And then I'd get back down again. And oh, I forgot something. Yeah, or just like one extra time, like just make sure. Mm -hmm. And jump up and take like a big breath and feel like, you know, that way I could tell myself later on when I'm sitting there, if I feel guilty, no, it's taken care of. I'm yeah, clean. My, my slate is clean. And so that's that's how I was trying. And I felt like I was... I felt like I was doing pretty good living up to, you know, God's righteousness. Like mm -hmm. I was staying clean. I was uh, staying pure. I felt like doing pretty good with staying pure, you know, try to keep my language good, listen to good music, like without, Same. yeah, without, uh, you know, bad words or whatever. And uh, so I was ready to get baptized. I thought I was like doing pretty good. And that's where... I think a big something kind of changed a bit because then I was supposed to confess my baseball at my baptism and that bothered me because here I was I felt like I was lying and that was a big thing I had mm. to you know stay true and yet if I was going to confess this something I wasn't sorry for I'd be lying All right and then uh the I think it was a day yeah it was a day before our baptism we sat down with the preachers and we had a book with all these rules i think it was a i'm not sure what it would be called but it was like a pretty thick book with all these rules like you know flowers on your dress the size of whatever and to to the t all these rules and so the preachers they sat down with us and there was i think three preachers and they said before you get baptized into the church we just need you to promise that you're going to follow this book. And I knew I hadn't been following the book and mm. I wasn't planning to follow the book because to me it didn't line up with the Bible. It just had all right. these extras. And and I knew like it didn't make any sense. How could I say that I'm going to follow this book at my baptism where I'm supposed to be dedicating my life right. to God and saying that I'm going to be true and here I'm lying. And so I I was like, well, I know I can't do this. So I said, I promise to follow God. And I was hoping that they would just assume that I was saying that I was. Okay. But they caught on. And they, they actually pressed it, eh? Yeah, and they said, that's good. But this is, this, you need to uh, promise to follow this book. Like, that's very important to uphold these standards and stuff and so we need that promise from you and i said i promise to follow the bible i tried a second time okay because i didn't want to lie and they said uh that's good and all but and and they whatever but you need to promise to follow this book and i was like everything was kind of going before me if i don't I don't get to marry Nettie. and can't I really, get baptized. Yeah. I can't get baptized. Like, all my friends are in here, and it's going to be, like, weird. Like, why are you not getting baptized? And so I just kind of shrugged and said, yeah. Hmm. And and I was, like, in a in a lot of turmoil. One of, the, one of the preachers, I guess, who wasn't quite as high up, he came afterwards, and he says, like, hey, what was going on there? Because I could tell you were, like, you know, pretty worked up. And I said... 
I said, like, I don't want to wear red pants, but there's nothing in the Bible saying I can't wear red pants. So I don't know why I should promise to wear black pants mm -hmm. and stuff. And and he says, well, some things we just do, even if it's not biblical and there's nothing wrong, but we do to keep peace and for our brother's sake, yeah, yeah. he said. And I wasn't happy. I went home. On the way home, I told my mom, I said, this this church is a joke. This is all a complete joke mm. because I just like I pretty much had to lie and yet I have to do this and she was like well maybe you know maybe you don't get baptized or she didn't really know what yeah. to do with it and yet she wanted because to them in a sense once you are ready to follow that book and those those promises and those rules and all that kind of stuff not promises so much then then you're ready to get baptized so now if you're still struggling with with doing that then maybe you're not maybe you're not ready after all right yeah but I you know I and I think I should have possibly I should have right there you know stepped back yeah but, but it was the avenue forward right it was the way to become accepted and eventually married exactly interesting yeah and so I did get baptized but uh, like it was kind of a crazy it crazy experience I yeah. guess for me well especially if you felt genuinely in your heart that you were not really being fully truthful that you weren't even living according to your own understanding and of, of righteousness and your standard of, of godliness right yeah where you were not uh, being truthful by saying you were going to do something when you knew you probably couldn't fully that's crazy yeah and then I and like the church was you know packed with people and they gave me a confession uh, that I had to read about my baseball that they wrote up. Oh, really? Yeah. So I, you know, I was supposed to read this whole thing about how I was sorry for playing and stuff. And I also knew that was, again, wasn't I true. I can't read that truthfully. And so actually, when I was baptized, I figured we're in front of, you know, a church packed with people if I don't read this exactly, if I just do again like I did the day before where I kind of make up my own so I don't lie, I don't think they'll call me out. And so that's what I did where I said, like, I I acknowledge that I've played baseball and I'm sorry where I failed. Okay. That's just what I said. Instead yeah. of reading the confession and it worked out like... They let that slip. Yeah. Okay. But it's interesting that you were being so cautious and careful, trying to navigate this in a way where you're being true to what you feel is is right and good. At the same time, you've got to comply in order to meet the status quo, right? Like this is how it is supposed to be done. Yeah. But a lot of a lot of kids, like you said before, would have just been like, "Sure, I know I'm not going to follow that, but I'm going to just obey it. I'm just going to say, yep, this is what I got to do and do it.'" Because I know when we did the Old Colony um, catechism classes, we tried it very much the same way too, where we saw some people doing it just to get married. And we were like, no, no, we want to do it for real. We want to really have a life change, right? We don't want to just do it just to, to get married. Yeah. And so we tried to be honest with it, tried to be you know, upfront and clear with it. But that's, that's tricky if you're, if you're understanding, because I didn't understand a lot of what was being taught in a way where you understood, I'm being asked to follow this book and you know, obey this but I don't think I can. Yeah. That's quite a conflict. So then you and Nettie got more serious after that. Yeah, exactly. Like, uh, I th like, uh, we started a uh, texting and, and stuff. We weren't allowed to do any of that stuff. And then you we had cell phones already. Yeah. Yep. And so, but yeah, we started texting and I guess, I felt like I still felt like I was trying my best. I was doing pretty good in living like from when I started. I felt like I was doing a pretty good job at uh you know living according to the Bible, a pretty good job at being a Christian. And I think that's like up until then or that's when it kind of changed like when me and her started uh hanging out and probably because I felt like uh one of the things I would have blamed on is people don't really understand me, you know, because I think a little bit differently. And so we would uh, disobey because I didn't believe in these rules anyways and following them. So we, we didn't do that at all. Like we were, 
when we started dating we were allowed to be together uh, every two weeks I think on a Sunday I'm not sure if I was able to bring her to church or not but we were together way more was that a written rule too or just something kind of understood accepted that was understood for dating couples you could start every other week and then after a while you could do uh, and pretty much everybody followed that rule yeah. you could start doing every week and then you usually got a phone call during the week okay one phone call but you were you were definitely pushing the limits there seeing Nettie way more yeah and, and secret we would do that like be, part of it was because we were texting you know so then we we text like crazy oh, yeah. amount yeah. which which wasn't good probably not a very healthy way to no start we would text i would text like we would text through the night even i wouldn't get any sleep and go to work and i was like a zombie <laughs> you know and and it's not even a very healthy way to communicate even now and like where texting is a generally accepted way of talking i think it's a good way to set something up hey we're going here we're doing that that's fine but if you're trying to get to know somebody you won't really get to know what they're thinking right you just get oh, I, I wish I was with you or oh, I can't wait to see you again and it's just all emotionally driven or can be anyway I could be off on that but I, th I think so and I think you'll text more daring stuff than you would ever dare to say in person either okay. you know like I think that got us into trouble too okay because we were just like non-stop always texting and yeah and, and now I think about our culture where everything is instant right whether it's snapchat or whatsapp or instagram or whatever they're just always they can share 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 all day long i know i've said to our girls before that uh, if they get to know a boy maybe you should actually write letters i know that's a little old-fashioned and i wouldn't necessarily say you have to but it might be a good way like a friend of mine he was on the podcast some years ago he got to know his wife who was in texas and for the first like several months, I forget how many, they wrote letters. And he said sometimes they still look back on those and they're like, this was monumental, instrumental. Like, this is what I think about this topic. And then there's a couple paragraphs. This is how I feel about that topic, a couple paragraphs in response. And then you're actually communicating what you're thinking about and what drives you, what motivates you. It's yeah. not just, hey, what are you doing this weekend? Oh, I can't wait to see you. It's not that, right? It's, yeah. Here's what my philosophy on this is. Here's what I think about that. Here's how I feel about this, right? And you're actually getting to know each other's, the way their mind thinks, right? Not yeah. just what gets you close to their body. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. So that got you guys into some trouble. And then you're seen as rebellious there again, right? You're not obeying the rules. You're seeing Nettie way more frequently than you should. You're texting. Yeah, a lot of that stuff they didn't know about, but we got caught because you were also supposed to have a completely hands-off courtship like mm -hmm. that was a must and we got caught because we didn't yeah and so then we were allowed to see each other every third well actually we had to be apart for quite a while hmm. and then we were able to be every third sunday in the afternoon or something you know to keep us torture eh? yeah <laughs> well i guess it would have been if we weren't sneaking off all yeah, the time yeah, yeah. I remember uh, some years ago, it's kind of a funny story. Maybe it's a bit too crude, but we, it was the first time having a male dog. We didn't know anything about it. And um, the neighbor's dog, a kilometer and a half up the road, went into heat. And we're like, what is this? The dog was just going wild, howling and moaning and you know barking. Every chance he got, he'd run down the road. So I'm like, this is ridiculous. I don't want to have him chained all day barking. I'll, I'll take a big cinder block and I'll chain him to the cinder block. That way he can drag it around the yard a bit. It was a stupid idea. Yeah. <laughs> drag it around the yard a bit, but at least then he he's, can kind of move around. Oh, I was working away and all of a sudden I'm like, I haven't heard that dog bark in a while. And then I'm like, oh boy. I went and drove a kilometer down the road and then I heard him howling there in the woods. He had dragged that cinder block a kilometer and a half down the road <laughs> into the woods. And now the block got stuck between two trees and he oh, couldn't get any man. further. And then the neighbor that's there, he's like... That's a good lesson about teenage boys. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's there is something uncontrollable. Like they can try to put a stop to that as much as they want. They can say only every three weeks. Those hormones are raging. Like oh yeah. You're fighting the uphill battle. I and I had every uh, block attached to me <laughs> possible. It seems like and. Uh, and you still kept driving forward. Oh yeah. So how did that all play out? Maybe we're making that story too long. I don't know. Um yeah i think like the bottom line is uh you know we got into everything 
like premarital sex and everything oh, right boy. and so and that's where it kind of crashed for me because all of a sudden i felt guilty yeah. you know I knew, now you're not just disobeying the rule book now you've gone contrary to the scripture to the bible yeah. exactly and even though i tried to make myself like we promised each other Mm -hmm. because we could only get married at a certain age and they already didn't want to marry us so we promised each other you know that we would uh you know be husband and wife kind of earlier before our almost marriage. to justify to it. justify it exactly and yet i felt guilty you know like i was like man like this is messed up you know i didn't really like now i couldn't if i went and prayed for forgiveness but i continued in it that didn't make any yeah, sense yeah. you know you know you're not gonna be able to stop no and i'm not even regretting it and so you know that kind of that's where my being good and stuff kind of crashed for a yeah. while and then we were able to get married though that was quite a struggle it was yeah they like uh preachers didn't want to marry us because we were kind of wild uh kids looked at and we moved we already got an apartment an hour away we were going to leave all of our stuff behind you were just going to leave the church and the, go the churches well yeah the churches we were going to find us a different you know church where we could start fresh and then try to start over and hopefully find a church that you know didn't have quite as many rules mm -hmm. and just somewhere where we could uh, start over interesting but this was before you even got married. You were hoping to just leave. Yeah, but we were actually, well, we we figured if we wouldn't get married, if they wouldn't marry us, then I found a drive through place in London that marries people, and we were going to get married there because wow. we were getting married. But we knew if we did that, none of our families could be at, and that would be like, Yeah, it's not know, what you wanted either. No, we didn't, like, because we still loved our family. Yeah. And actually, like, a lot of, a lot of friends and stuff yeah still. that's a tricky place to be in because you can't you almost can't resist like paul actually says it's better to marry than to burn like there's a drive there let each man have his own wife each wife have her own a woman have her own husband because that drive to fornicate is extremely strong right yeah and so it's better to marry just go ahead right but they wanted you to be godly first before you got there which i understand that there should be some parameters set around those relationships to keep yeah. people from from fornicating right but then it shouldn't be like hey you can't you can't you can't you can't right yeah and i wouldn't i definitely take the blame like the majority of the blame because i'm supposed to be the man in the situation mm -hmm. at the same point though if you just tell a young guy you don't do this don't do this and never build a relationship with him and say this is how you're actually going to feel when you're with a girl like it's not going to be that easy it's not just going to be like okay we're doing hands off and you're gonna like if you're attracted and you hang out a lot and you're gonna want to mm -hmm. so i do feel like there was it wasn't like all my fault or yeah. you know if somebody built a relationship with me and said look this is how tough it's going to be I believe there's a good chance we could have stood and we would have stayed away from this texting, but because it was all no, and you guys shouldn't even uh, be together, we just pushed and pushed. Mm -hmm. And and like I say, I do take, you know, a big. It is my responsibility. Yeah, yeah I can see that it's, it's better not to blame anybody, but uh, the the circumstances around it are definitely trying. Almost like the baseball thing, where you have this urge, this drive to play ball. And they're saying, you can't, you can't. And it's like, oh, I really want to. But then the drive for this is like 10 times more where yeah. I can't even control it. I'm, when I'm around her, I just, I can't. I, I don't know how to maintain, right? And yeah. so there would have to be really clear guidance and instruction around that. Yeah, and a good uh, life lesson for me with raising boys now, mm -hmm. you know. So some of that can be, uh, I can definitely use that going forward for sure, with for my sure. kids and with other interesting uh, yeah so they they eventually after much persuasion and a lot of back and forth there was a wedding allowed to happen exactly and then the families could be there yep then did you move away then yep we right away moved and uh north of here somewhere yeah to tavistock okay yeah so there was a church there that you felt you could align with a bit better we thought at first but we felt the same way it felt exactly the same way that we were kind of outsiders and not accepted because we 
I was still that kind of a thinker. And so at first we didn't care much about church, to be honest. Like Nettie got a job uh, at the nursing home. And, well, she became a PSW then. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, so she would work a lot of hours, even weekends. She would just take shifts and I would just hang out and watch movies and okay and not too much uh like we go maybe tw maybe twice a month to church ish and then there, we, there must have been a rule against having a tv though i think it depends uh there's more uh sort of liberal or whatever churches so in some conservative churches you're allowed to like not have not so much have tv but you can watch movies okay so interesting but then we did find a little uh country church out there and i feel like it was like they i guess the reason i felt comfortable is i remember going there and they had summer it was a conservative church and they had summer bible school and i remember one of the kids so we went there for a summer bible school program and i seen one of the kids had shorts on it was just a kid from town and he was included in the Bible school program. Mm -hmm. And I was like, man, if they accept a kid with shorts, then most likely these guys will accept me. Okay. And so that's where we started attending. And, and uh, yeah, I think it was kind of good for our, because we were a lot more just accepted as we, we were. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, that's where we... I, I remember seeing, I don't know if it was you or maybe someone else from a similar type of congregation. I noted back then... That it looked strange almost that uh, some of the guys looked totally secular. You would never be able to tell they were Mennonite even. They just looked normal and dressed nice, cool store-bought clothes. Yep. And the women still wore homemade dresses. And it was very particular what the women wore, right? Yeah. And that would be, yeah, there's quite a few of those churches up towards Milverton, that yeah. area, where that's exactly how we always looked. Kind of reminds me a little bit of the Muslims, right? Where the Muslim men, you wouldn't be able to tell that they're religious. And then their wives are just head to toe completely covered up right yeah. and obviously i think you and i know as men that there is a slight difference between men and women i don't think you need to change the standard though it's just even the apostle paul says men should pray everywhere lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting women should adorn themselves with modest apparel shamefacedness and sobriety like even paul recognized that men are going to have a harder time with lust so like let's make sure the women cover up a little bit and be modest and indecent in their appearance but there's really no clear-cut rules or lines around it, right? Yeah. It's be moderate. Exactly. Yeah. So then uh, that's when you got into hockey? Yep. Yeah. That's that's kind of where I poured everything. Like, I didn't... And it felt like I was... Uh, I didn't need people that much. You know, like, Nettie, she always needed... It very like, social. Very social. So she was always becoming friends with the... You know, in that group, she got a bunch of friends and and then i just kind of took hockey and, okay and that became my like th yeah that's when you i got, got your camaraderie your friendships there right just exactly hit each other on the boards yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah i got obsessed with that yeah and you're pretty good man yeah. i remember i one time just skating around with you trying to touch you and i couldn't we were trying to play touch tag and there's no way i could get anywhere near you and i'm oh, yeah. i'm not a great skater but i'm okay i yeah. can move around but so you got uh, pretty into it. Yeah, and it, it, would, it was pretty funny at the time because I wasn't really good at the time at all. And I didn't even understand the hockey rules. I didn't know, like, offside and okay. icing and all this stuff. So I just went to, to town. I was so into it. I didn't care how embarrassing it was for me. And so I just asked guys, you know, I'd go to the arena and find a group of guys who were playing pickup hockey, and I'd be like, hey, can I join? And... Guys are pretty easy going. First of all, if you go in there, they expect you to actually know a little bit something about mm -hmm. hockey. They don't just expect a complete rookie who doesn't yeah. even know any rules. You'd to skate come. around a pond, you can handle a puck, but you didn't know how the game was supposed to go. Exactly. And so I remember guys, I get yelled at from these guys, and they're just guys from town because, you know, I didn't know. I would be offside, and they're waiting for me to go back, you know, and they'd be yelling at me and stuff but i didn't care i just loved the game so much and yeah. i studied i would get apps i actually looked into going to you know school somewhere and getting trained like i was calling around trying okay. to get trained to play and i just played like and it was crazy like i i think i neglected 
then I, you know, neglected Nettie in our marriage even because I was just like, she would work during the day and a little bit of the evening or she'd work a night shift and we'd have a little time and I was often out playing hockey and yeah, it became like an idol to me, I guess. Yeah, I guess so. Yeah, yeah that has, there's a blessing and a curse to being good at something, right? Where yeah. it can become too much. You get obsessed over it. Mm -hmm. the, how did the how was your spiritual life at this point were you still trying to serve God in any way it uh, slowly I started I was like you know now that big sinful part of dating has passed now I can go back to my re recommit my life again and start my with my old you know pleasing God by praying and my same prayer and trying to do the best I could again mm-hmm and so that's kind of what I did. That, and then I would listen to, because uh, I'd work in London, and so I'd be driving there, and so I'd listen to Faith FM, okay. which is London Christian Station. And so there'd be guys like uh, Vernon McGee. Oh, yeah. And stuff on there. And so I'd listen to these got guys. Some good stuff. Yeah. And so, and often from listening to these guys, I would be kind of re recommitting my life again like while I was driving to work just listening to them kind of being convicted again mm -hmm. and, and yeah and I'd asked my dad like I was like dad like these guys on here are they Christians or not because if, if we're the only Christians with with the rules what about all these guys because they talk like they were excited about mm -hmm. the Bible and their whole life was dedicated to that and I was like and he says like well some you know we're not gonna judge and and uh yeah like they he agreed he actually listened to some of these guys himself hmm. to like some of those uh, was charles stanley is mm -hmm. he a uh, older and vernon mcgee so uh yeah i guess that's i kind of went r right back into my works again and uh, and always questioning the church's ways exactly but it kind of changed where it didn't bother me very much at this point because I got to do what I want to do. I got to right. play hockey, and Nettie was happy with her friend group there. And so at that point, you know, it didn't really matter. If, you like, weren't trying to impress the preachers to get married or to get baptized or anything like that. Now you were just, you could do what you wanted more or less. Exactly, and even I could kind of dress how I wanted because I didn't hang it. Like we were out there, I didn't know too many people. Yeah. And so I could just kind of live by my, follow my Bible yeah. idea. Interesting. What yeah. brought you guys back down this way then? Because I know that's where you and I got reconnected or maybe connected really for the first time. All of a sudden you showed up at church. Yeah, I think still like the connection with family uh, over here at the first. Is what it was, yeah, still. exactly. Like they're always doing corn day or canning something and her mom has a garden and you know a big farm there mm -hmm. to hang out with so we'd be there quite a bit hanging out with her family and so uh and we were kind of loners out there in the middle of like we actually ended up moving to woodstock that's where we bought our first place okay and so we were we were kind of in the middle because our church and them were out towards started at like tavistock but then went those churches went towards milverton and drayton and all the, that area and then our family was over here so we were in the middle and it felt like after after a while a few years quite a few years i guess you know all those tensions and stuff kind of eased off with family right, and right. seeing they people get used to it and, and in a way i think it was by far the best thing we could have ever done was to move away okay because it was like me and her against the world kind of starting out on our own we had to figure out stuff because we felt like each other was the only one who kind of yeah. understood each other right yeah and so in that way i feel like we have so many awesome memories even though i was obsessed and talking and stuff like she'd always be coming along and we did practically you know everything together yeah, there was like, nobody else yeah in the evenings we'd be going for walks and in Tavistock which is a nice little town yeah and so I think that was kind of gave us at least a after our rocky yeah there's there's nothing worse for a marriage <clears throat> than a a man or a wife who refuses to leave mother and father right the Bible is very clear on that leave father mother mother and cleave to your wife 
and when the when the extended family gets to put their hands into your marriage it's very makes for a very rocky marriage yeah so yeah leading and, and just cleaving to your wife and, and building a relationship is probably best oh, but yeah. then after how many years of marriage did you come back to this area hmm. how many years have you been married now we were married in 09 so oh, nice. whatever that is eh? yeah <laughs> 15 years something I like I'm that 35 well, I got married at 19 so yeah, yeah. 15, 15 16, 16 yeah. there you go so I think Cohen uh, he's 11 now and I I'm not sure if we had him probably so maybe like 5 years into our marriage when we moved back okay so and also there's like over here at the time was more opportunity like it's expensive out that way even more there than here even yeah, more yeah. there yeah um, you were still wrestling with some of these things, your convictions before God and all that. Oh yeah. When you it started was, coming back this way. Yep. And so some of your brothers in law got saved, uh, Dave Newfeld and them. That's, he played a huge part in me ever coming out of religion where, uh, you know, he, he all of a sudden was born again and he understood the gospel and he came to me and you know, he had tears running down his face, and he was just so excited. <laughs> and and I didn't, you know, I didn't understand it because he was even like, he's like, man, he would look at the crowds like, I can't wait for Jesus to come. Yeah. He was one hundred, like he was just one hundred percent clear. He was ready, and he was waiting for. He's Whereas like, before, he was probably more rebellious in the he, system than you were. He was like, I would have counted myself as a good Christian he didn't he didn't have time for that stuff he knew he wasn't a christian and he didn't even try to really act it we all knew he wasn't a i see a christian and so and i would have been a member like at the church there and always kind of doing good things whereas he he wouldn't uh he wasn't a member no time for that no and so all of a sudden he was just so sure of his salvation and uh, we would start getting uh into some pretty you know into arguments and yeah and he also he hang out with uh jake fair oh yeah and like so these guys started impacting me because i didn't have uh, like mo even the new churches we were part of often they would have discussions on the bible and i never agreed with these guys because it it seemed like there was always the rules mm -hmm. uh at play like i remember one time for instance there was a discussion about like the head covering and they said in spanish it's a wife however okay. that translation is but in english it's a, a woman. woman yep and so they were having this argument and one guy said well what if the spanish one is right and the other guy said well there's no way and the one guy said well could we be wrong and there was not even we couldn't even question if there could be wrong or not this is how it is the english version and i i was always like man this is like why can't we interesting whereas study this? in old colony a woman didn't typically wear a head covering until they were married exactly but so they would have went was, according yeah. to that translation because in german it's like that, that too i think the martin luther translation i'd have to double check that yeah i think it's wife there and so these guys like with uh, dave and with jake you know i could hash out anything you yeah. could question everything and you would tell the other guy straight out you're just full of baloney you know, like, and that's kind of how we rolled. Yeah. And so I actually played hockey with uh, Jake on a team. And this guy was out there telling these guys straight, that is like, you're living in sin. He would pretty much tell you. And to me, that was like, whoa, I just want to be my quiet little yeah, self. Yeah. And so. And Jake was more evangelistic, right? He wants people to know. Exactly. And so that kind of, you know, had. Uh, an impact on me I think because I was like uh, yeah why is why maybe I this guy has something to say to me if he's that concerned about others that yeah. we we're playing with so and uh, you were starting to maybe kind of get the understanding of grace a little bit then or that it wasn't about works or no yeah Dave would tell me he's like there's absolutely nothing you can do uh to be saved except for you know put your trust in christ and i would just 
I would push against that so much because all this from the time I was 15 or 14 till now I had been confessing and and regretting and doing all these things and trying and feeling like I was you know doing enough and I was like oh no you have to you have to now in a sense all of that was useless exactly that would mean that I hadn't been saved that I you know I didn't understand the gospel and all of a sudden this new guy and so I said like I remember being at uh Dave's place the one time and I said because he was sharing to me and my brother-in-law he was saying like guys this like the bible and he had I thought like all kinds of ideas where he was saying like this part of the new testament is still written under the law these guys were still under the law and here's and he was just you know on fire about this and the only thing you can do is believe and I said to him what about the beatitudes and he's like what are the Beatitudes anyways? And right away, I was like, huh, see, he doesn't even, he doesn't even know. know his Bible. He doesn't even know what the Beatitudes are. And I went away from there feeling like so self-righteous yeah, and like yeah. a Pharisee. I remember driving away and like to Nettie, like, like he's so mixed up. And he actually went inside. He says to his wife, I don't think there's any hope for Johnny and Nettie. <laughs> he's like, he's so religious. I don't think there's a chance this guy can be saved yeah and and that's kind of how we continued but i kept questioning you know not feeling at peace not having the peace kind of that he did and uh and we got to a point where i started thinking hey maybe it is all you have to do is believe and so i I remember quite clearly too we lived in our other house in Copenhagen and when we were on the couch me and Eddie and we were begging God like please we just want to know truth together praying this way yeah yeah just begging God we're just begging we want to know the truth wow and uh and yeah I think uh that was yeah maybe a bit of a uh turning point or whatever yeah, yeah. And and we we were like God, we're okay with looking like whatever Muslims, anything, but we just want to know the truth. We mm-hmm. want to know that we're accepted. And and so then after that, I kind of I soon thought I understood the gospel. So I thought, I said to Nettie, all it is is you have to believe. All you do is you believe. But now my life became focused on my faith, like my believing. So I would question myself, like, does my life prove that I believe in Jesus? Mm. And it was still, still all a works f- thing. All it works. It was all focused on myself. It nothing changed. And so I thought, I thought now I understood, but it was still all about my belief. You know, was I believing? And so, and during that time, like when we went on vacations, Nettie wouldn't dress like it because I would tell her, like, you know, you're, we just dress like that for people. So then she would just dress like a normal person. So we looked like Didn't normal. Look conservative then. Exactly. And so I said to her, like, at that point, I was like, you know what? That's useless because God sees us. Let's stop pretending. Let's stop pretending. So we stopped uh, doing that. And uh, and then I thought I, like I say, I thought I kind of understood. And I would still, like, I wanted that from God, him to show me that, you know, I was accepted, Yeah. that my belief was enough. So I was always like, I'd pray and tell God I believe. I wanted like maybe that right when I said that, the clouds would move and the sun would shine on me or something. So I could feel, yeah, exactly. That God was saying it was like, I still wanted that confirmation. I still didn't have uh, that knowing that I was good. Full assurance. Yeah, because your confidence was in the in the 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 way that we receive the grace of God is by faith, but you were trying to impress God by your faith and hoping that faith would be the thing that would save you. Exactly. Whereas it's grace that saves you. Yeah. And you receive that grace by faith. Yeah. By grace are you saved through faith. Yeah. There's a big difference there. Some people think it's their faith that would impress God, and God would see, oh, this guy's got lots of faith. We can save him. Yeah. And then it's, you're being saved by your faith. No, we're being saved by grace. I just received it by faith, right? Yeah. 
So that went on for a little bit, eh? You were struggling with having enough faith. Yeah, I so I finally, I thought I knew. And then that's when, I guess, when I heard you. And so I'd hang out with Dave and we would discuss, uh, you know, he was studying his Bible like mad. A lot, yeah. Yeah, and then we would discuss all this stuff. And uh, and then that's when I heard you preach the one time about uh, quit searching for that mountaintop experience that happened at the cross mm. and you know that just hit home because from when i was 14 i was searching for a on my knees beside my bed that yeah. mountaintop experience i was always searching for that and all of a sudden i realized like you know that's when it happened like there's no mountaintop experience that could even happen you know the sun and a rainbow and stars could fall and everything could happen right now and that's not even close to what happened at the cross when jesus died for mm-hmm. me and and you know his blood was enough and his life was enough and all of a sudden and so it wasn't like boom but you know it started turning and all of a sudden i started realizing like man even my belief my no matter i could pray from now till the day i die i could read the bible from now till i die i could you know believe and confess and everything i had been trying to earn my salvation with that was all not even close to enough mm-hmm. the only thing that was enough was jesus blood yeah, and his perfect life and, it, and that is faith your attention got taken away from yourself and the things you were doing and it got placed on what god wants your attention on that's his work wow that's what he did that's what his suffering was all about. That's why he died on the cross. And now you're not looking inside yourself to produce faith. You're looking to him who saved you and faith is born, right? It's like that's what it produces faith almost, right? When you look yeah. to what Christ has done, the response is, wow. That wow is faith. You're trusting in it. You're, you're banking on it, right? You're, yeah. You believe that that can do what it says it has done, right? Yeah. Like a... Like walking over a bridge, like you can look at that bridge all day and say, man, that's an amaz- amazing bridge. I wish I had enough faith to be on that bridge. No, stop thinking about your faith. Just get on the bridge. If you're on the bridge, that means you're believing in it. You're trusting it, right? Yeah. So when you see Christ and he's the only one able to get you from lost to saved and you jump on and you're like, wow, God did this for me. Now you had faith. You're, you're on that bridge now, right? You're now trusting in it. You're completely banking on it. That's my hope. That's my only way of salvation. Yeah. Yeah, and and now I could question. Up till then, I always questioned myself. Like, right. did I repent enough? Did I? And all of a sudden, I realized, no, I didn't repent enough. None of my stuff was. But now I could question. Did do I believe Christ lived a perfect life? Well, yes, I I believe that. Do I believe God was pleased with His blood? Hundred percent. I. Amen. It makes sense that He was pleased <laughs> with His Son's blood. And now I knew where that confidence came from, and Dave. Like now to stand before God with Christ's righteousness. Yes. Now I'm, you know, now I can have that confidence. Now, yeah. when whenever you want to come, uh, Jesus, I'm ready because I can stand before God with your righteousness. So yeah. all of a sudden, the focus, the focus changed from myself. Mm-hmm. To, I don't know if I would have said it then, but that's often one of the things I would be like t- t- challenging people. Do you believe that when Jesus died, God was pleased with it? Well, yeah, of course. How about when he was raised from the dead? Was he accepted into heaven? Of course, he's the best man that ever lived. He didn't sin. And, and he, when he came up to heaven, God led him in there? Yeah. Does he have eternal life? Does Jesus have eternal life? Yes. Are you, are you accepted based on what you've done or what he's done? What he's done. Okay, so if he has eternal life, do you? Exactly. Because you're, you're accepted on the exact same merits that Jesus is accepted on. If he's fully accepted and you have no trouble believing that, then why wouldn't you be able to believe that you're accepted? Because God has de- chosen to accept you based on His Son's work. You know, like that's, there's so much beauty and simplicity in that, but it's easily missed when you're trying to be religious. Absolutely, when you're focusing on yourself. And yeah, it's so relieving even after when you've been trying to tell yourself for all this time that you, were, you are enough and your, your little measly works is enough. When you finally realize that's not even close to enough. God was looking for more. Yeah, that's that's that was relieving to know, man, all this time uh, I haven't been enough. And to mm-hmm. just 
I acknowledge that yeah. as well. Even when you think of like yours and mine, maybe was a little different, but I tried to be good too. And my way of making up for sin was things like, well, I'm going to have to go to church on Sunday, or I'm going to have to give money, or I'm going to have to pray more prayers or something, right? I, I got to make up for it. When the Old Testament clearly called for blood. Like, you think being, feeling bad is enough? Like, a Jew back under the Old Covenant couldn't have just said, I feel really bad for my sin. The they, elders would have said to him, I don't care how bad you feel. Go take the lamb, bring it to the priest. We'll spill the blood. We'll burn it up before God. Then you'll be forgiven. Not just for feeling bad, yeah. but in our system, it was just, oh, you got to feel bad. You got to respond to an altar call. You got to pray really hard. That's not blood. That's not nearly enough. Yeah. And, and the New Testament even says, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. So what sacrifice can you offer? The sacrifice of Christ. Yeah. What can wash away my sins? You've probably sang that your whole life, right? Absolutely. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. So there, then there was some celebration in your soul after a bed, eh? Absolutely, yeah. yeah. That's, uh, and I do find, like, before when I was always, you know, trying to repent and a lot of those uh, works I was trying to do, I think that is actually naturally comes once you understand what Christ did. Mm. Now you actually do regret. Yeah. You know, you're naturally going to regret yeah. what you did. But, yeah, it's uh, now to be able to go on to, you know, even talk to Dave or whoever and then just a desire for uh, anybody who's in my shoes or the shoes that I was in to be you, able to be freed in. you can even look back at your your former self 16 18 years old and 2021 20, all those ages and see there was rebellion in you there was sinfulness in you like even in all your attempts to try to be good clearly you had you were dealing with your own selfishness and sin and you know, often the elders were probably right and you were wrong and all that kind of stuff, right? Absolutely. Now I realize I wasn't even close. Like I thought that so with close. my, yeah, I thought with my prayers and living pure, I thought like even almost like here and there, whatever. But now I think I was like, man, you weren't even, even close. You were messing up here and there. And like you say, rebellious and mm -hmm. not respecting my dad and, and so yeah, many yeah. things like. There was a, a preacher years ago that gave an illustration. I think it was Michael Pearl. Yeah, it was Michael Pearl where he was talking about uh, um, there's an island over here. This is eternal life. And over here, there's a group of people that are trying to get there. And they got to jump over to that island to get there. The first guy up is a little five-year-old. He runs and, you know, boom, splashes into the water. He, he made like, this big of a jump. Next guy up is a 12-year-old. He jumps in three feet. And it's like, oh, that's not bad. But you didn't, the, the, the island's over here. Next guy, 15, 16 year old, strong, athletic teenager, right? He runs and he just sails over the first kid and over the second kid and he's way into the water, like, you know, eight, 10, 12 feet, splash, he's still in the water. Next up is in a professional Olympian, like the best jumper in the world. He runs, gets a big running start and he jumps over the first and over the second, way past the teenage kid, splash, he's in the water. <laughs> They were all so far off, not even yeah. they didn't even make a difference, right? In yeah. the grand scheme of things, it's like, okay, you were good, but you made it this far, and you made it this far, and you made it this far. But the island's over there. Yeah. Like, you weren't even close to good enough. Christ was good enough. Yeah, and the more you realize how bad you were, often, like, the self-righteousness, and, you know, when I thought David didn't understand or didn't even know the Beatitudes, or when I really think of my thought life or stuff like that, I realized that I was, I wasn't even, didn't even make it into the water, you know, <laughs> like I was actually, you're worse. Still standing on the shore. Yeah, you're just, you realize how uh, sinful you really are, yeah. it's not even close. That's amazing that we can now begin that whole new legacy, right, where you can hopefully from young on teach your children the difference between law and grace and understanding that you need to see that you're going to fall short and then you need to immediately see that there was a sacrifice made and hopefully we won't get it right either you're not going to perfect everything with your your parentings right but hopefully yeah. they can have a little clearer picture of the grace and law difference right and see that christ is enough that it's not about your doings absolutely now you guys have been married 15 years. Your oldest is 11, you said? Yep. 11 years old. Um, what's next? 
What are you doing? You're serving with a youth group right now, still, right? You get yep. to share the youth, uh, share the gospel with youth regularly. Yep. And you're still getting peace and pleasure from knowing that Christ is enough. Exactly. And I and I think uh, the one thing, like I've been, I was always the last one to share or like to do any public speaking. I was actually that was the biggest fear of my getting married was that I had to go afterwards in front of all these people, you know, but I was like, man, I love, yeah, exactly. And so I think that's something that's changed. Uh, That's one of a big thing I noticed after I understood the gospel was realizing like, it's not about me Mm. whatsoever. And, uh, you know, I died with Christ. And so now he lives in me. And so, you know, like to be used of him i guess is because it's yeah. it's not about me and Absolutely. if i you know flounder around here and talk all awkwardly and whatever it's that's not what it's about it's about christ yeah. so i found for myself too and and i don't know exactly it's hard to analyze yourself fully right i i grew up in a family that was had a pretty easy time talking and stuff but yet public speaking i didn't like in school to try to present a a study that I had done, I hated it. I was nervous. I did a terrible job. I wasn't confident, wasn't comfortable. But then as soon as I understood the gospel and I felt like, hey, people need to know this, then I can share it. And it was like, I, hey, you're over here. You should be here. And now I get something to tell you, right? Yeah. And I'm sure I messed up so many times, but it was exciting for me to now have something to convince people of. Or I was seeing a beautiful truth here. So, Absolutely. I've Yeah, that's something I learned recently was when i was sharing with somebody because i wanted them to know the truth instead of saying you need this and this i was able to say i mm. was a chief of sinners i was this is how up. i used to see it exactly and now i understand you know god's grace and mercy on me and that christ was enough and that i could never be enough and i think that Amen. that helps with sharing so no, that's good stuff was there anything else you had hoped to make mention of that I maybe didn't distracted you from with all my questions I don't think so (laughs) (laughs) no I appreciate finally being able to do this it's been a good a year or two probably since we talked about maybe doing it so yeah that's fun exciting story it uh, I find that thinking over our conversation here now it it took like a good probably almost an hour till you finally got to the gospel because you're you were so much packed into the way you were raised and how you were trying and trying and trying and then to see that it's simply Christ, and you had to kind of dismiss all your former works. You know, count my own works as dung, as the Apostle Paul said. Yeah. And and then receive the righteousness that comes from Christ. That's good stuff. Yeah. Right on. Appreciate you sharing with us. All right. Thanks for having me. Good stuff.